Welcome to the um, the first seminar for this year in our uh, distinguished uh, seminar series. It's really a uh, special privilege to be able to introduce Andre Lupash, uh, who will be giving our very first uh, distinguished seminar um, of, of the entire series. Um, Andre is the current director of the Department of Protein Evolution here at the Max Planck Institute of Developmental Biology in Tübingen. Um, Andre will talk about the revolution in protein structure uh, prediction. Andre, I think, is extremely well suited to tell us about this, uh, aside from his great level of expertise uh, and knowledge in the area. Uh, Andre is also was one of the judges in this CASP 14 um, structure determination competition that AlphaFold 2 um, so impressively uh, trounced the competition. So, uh, Andre, uh, thank you for being the first person in our uh, seminar series, uh, and I will hand over to you. Thank you, John. And I see we're almost at 300. So allow me to start with a quote from uh, my fellow Max Planck director, Thomas Lengauer, and also a great scientist whom I admire very much. He um, identified a number of challenges in computational biology, uh, grand challenges, uh, one of which was uh, the protein structure prediction problem. And he identified two criteria for grand challenges. One, that the problem is obviously fundamental um, for science. And two, that the problem is so hard, it will only be solved after the initial relevance of the problem has just about vanished. Now, Today, I would like to convince you that far from having vanished, uh, the solution we're going to um, see, although we won't understand how it works, um, portends some dramatic changes in the way the life sciences um, operate and the kinds of goals that we can hope to achieve. Um, another Quotation that I think is interesting in this context uh, is from Haldane. And uh, he basically suspected that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. And so by uh, paraphrasing this, uh, the question is, is protein structure more complicated than we can imagine? And is that the basis for the reason why Thomas Lengauer suspected we would not get a solution in useful time. And again, what I'm going to show you today suggests that this might be true because we needed artificial intelligence to achieve the solution. And uh, this showed two things. The first, that there were already enough data in our databases in order to solve the problem. And two, that the human brain was obviously not capable of figuring out a solution unaided. So, hmm. so let me start with a few general remarks about proteins. Why do we even care about the protein folding problem and its solution? And the answer, well, is uh, for obvious reasons, life is the result of the chemical activity of proteins. Uh, certainly life today is. And in our uh, DNA protein world, nucleic acids are only there to specify which proteins are made when, where, and in what amounts. Everything else is done by proteins. And if we look at this, um, image, an artist's view of a cross-section through a part of Escherichia coli. We see the nucleic acids, the DNA, and we see RNA also in these particles, which are the ribosomes, and we see lipids, uh, but most of what is in the cell is protein, and the proteins are everywhere. They um, replicate the DNA, they repair it, um, 
they transfer materials, they package, uh, they assist the ribosomes in making more proteins, they carry the entire metabolism, they are throughout the inner and the outer membrane, and they're even outside the cell, not shown here. So the same is fundamentally true also in eukaryotes. This is a comparison between a human cell and uh, Escherichia coli, the cell we saw in the image uh, before. Um, now, although the eukaryotic cell is typically three orders of magnitude larger and has a much more complexity due in large part also to all these internal compartments that are being made, when we look at the cross sections, we see that virtually everything is full of proteins, whether it's the cytosol, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the Golgi, or even the extracellular space. So these proteins, which carry the chemistry of life, have a very large diversity. And beyond that, one thing they all have in common, as you can see in this image, is they are structured. There are intrinsically unstructured proteins. I might touch several times on them, but it is a peculiarity of proteins that unless they assume a defined three-dimensional structure, they cannot execute chemistry. So most of what makes proteins essentially in life cannot be done without structure. And so let us briefly look at the structure. Um, here we see one kind of representation that's very popular among structural biologists. It's called the C-alpha trace. And uh, here each amino acid is shown by a single point in space, the position of its C-alpha carbon. And these carbons are connected by sticks. Uh, you can color the elements of regular secondary structures so that it becomes easier to see the architecture, or you can even uh, engage in uh, wider ranges, flights of fancy, and um, replace the beta strands with arrows showing the direction in which they run, and the helices either by helical ribbons or by cylinders. But all these proteins, no matter how simple or complex they are, have in common the fact that they are synthesized as linear chains of amino acids. Here I have colored the chain from blue to red, going from the amino terminus to the carboxy terminus, and you see it is a single chain. And every protein we have seen in the previous slides is also a single chain. And this is due to the fact that proteins are synthesized from an information re, uh, deposited in DNA, and DNA is a linear molecule. So in the transcription and translation steps, we're just moving information from one macromolecule to the other macromolecule, but the linear nature of this information stays intact. All right, so uh, this already prepares us for the next point. The structure of a protein is fully encoded in its amino acid sequence, in its gene. So if you know the gene sequence, if you have this information, you should actually be able to know this information. And this is called the protein folding problem. How can we know the structure of a protein if all we have is the sequence of its gene. Now, why is this a problem? Why, why can't we just apply uh, physical principles uh, to deduce how the structure must look? And there are two primary reasons why this is the case. One is that most polypeptide chains do not have a folded structures. Most proteins do, but proteins are a minuscule subset of polypeptide chains that are possible. 
by far the most polypeptide chains, which you might uh, synthesize randomly, will not give you a folded structure. They will remain more or less random coils or start precipitating as amyloid. And in fact, the number is much smaller than people generally believe. Um, I would estimate that a chain length of 100 residues, which is really small for a protein, the likelihood of folding is just one in 10 to the 20th. And for most, site, uh, with, uh, for most uh, residue numbers that are relevant, polypeptide chains, let's say in the order of 200, 250 residues, their chance of folding is probably below one in 10 to the 50th. And so by far the most polypeptide chains do not fold. And for those that fold, the free energy of folding is typically only a few kilocalories per mole. For a typical globular protein, around 10 kilocalories per mole, which is equivalent to about five to seven hydrogen bonds. Now, a protein makes hundreds of hydrogen bonds. So how does the protein navigate a landscape in which the differences in energy are so small that they amount to just one or a handful of hydrogen bonds. And this is something that we haven't yet been able to figure out. But what we have seen is that using physical principles to infer protein structure has been extremely difficult because we had to have extremely exact representations in order to even be close to a natural environment. And these are extremely computation intensive. <clears throat> and often we don't know more at the end of a, such a simulation than we knew at the beginning. Now, despite this problem, there were many physicists in the late 80s and early 90s, just around the time when I was a graduate student, who were publishing articles claiming substantial or even decisive progress in the stru structure prediction problem. And at one point, a physicist turned crystallographer, John Mould, decided to start an experiment to test what these predictions were actually work, uh, worth. And something we have to keep in mind, all these predictions were not predictions, they were post-dictions, because the people developing the computational methods already knew what the answers were. And so John started the critical assessment of structure prediction, which is generally known as CASP. And CASP1 in 1994, I would call an extinction level event. Practically none of the methods that were used to make the predictions turned out to be of much value. And most of the time, uh, they were even seen as counterproductive. And so a lot of methods stopped being used. And in fact, a lot of groups that participated in CASP1 never returned to CASP. Now in CASP2, we will see a graph. Uh, there was not much progress. And the New York Times um, headlined its article with proteins one, computer zero but also noted that failure can no longer be guaranteed. And in CASP3, that was the first one in which I participated uh, with a team from GlaxoSmithKline, which uh, comprised also um, Rob Russell, who is now in Heidelberg, and uh, Christine Brown, who is still at GlaxoSmithKline. Um, CASP3 saw the rise of what I would call the empiricists. Uh, people who had realized that homologous proteins preserved their structure, the ancestral structure, even across enormous evolutionary times, uh, started investing most of their effort in finding distant homologs in order to conclude on structural properties. And that turned out to be fairly powerful. And so since then, sequence homology has become a primary source for information, and it is still so today. Uh, most of the methods today 
work by multiple sequence alignments in which we try to learn from what nature has done in the protein world. And some important developments were um, Cyblast in 1997, Hammer in 98, and HHPRED, which was developed here in Tübingen in 2005. Now, as an aside for the next figure that I will show you, um, GDT is uh, an abbreviation for global distance test, which is a way of measuring the similarity of two structures that have the same amino acid sequence. And basically what you do is you iteratively superimpose the two structures and look at the distance between the equivalency alpha carbons. And if they're within, let's say one angstrom of each other, there's a certain score that you gain. If they're only within two angstroms of each other, you gain a lower score, three angstrom, four angstrom, and so on. And uh, after 20 angstrom, I think, is the final cutoff, you don't get anything anymore, because that's practically random. So this is how these GDTs are calculated. And there's two GDT values. There's GDT TS, which is the total score and GDTHA, which is the high accuracy score and which rewards particularly good solutions. Now, uh, this is one of the targets um, that I tried to solve in CASP3 and I'm showing it to you in order to give you an idea of what a good model was at the time, right? So this was considered uh, a, a good prediction and yet when you superimpose the actual structure to the model we submitted, you can see that not only was only the core roughly equivalent, but in fact, there were topological errors, like for example, these two strands being reversed in their order. So overall, the shape of this model is quite different from the actual structure. And there are serious errors in it, which you know, I would be hard pressed even then, I would have been hard pressed to call them details. Uh, another thing that I, well, sometimes I can't forward my slides. Uh, another thing that I did uh, right around CASP3, uh, together with my colleague, uh, Kristen Brown, was a model for the export domain of this fiber. And um, I predicted that the coiled coil, which forms the stalk of the fiber, would be in the barrel that is embedded in the membrane. And based on, on uh, sequence properties and homologs, I made um, a prediction that this would look roughly like this. Chris built the model. And here you can see the structure, and we got the topology right. But again, you know, you'd be really generous to call the errors in this model details relative to the structure. You can see the shear number of the barrel is different. The periodicity of the coiled coil is different. This is a seven residue periodicity and the actual periodicity is 11 residues. And yet this was at the time something I was tremendously proud of and something that most people considered a really good prediction, right? So with these two examples, I hope you have a little bit of an expectation background of what counted as really good predictions in CASP3. So let's move on to CASP4, where, uh, oh, I actually expected a different slide here. Ah. I expected this slide. Never mind. Let's first talk this slide through. Uh, CASP4 in 2000 saw the beginnings of Rosetta from David Baker's group, which was the first platform that tried to incorporate biophysical parameters with these sequence information approaches and marked a very clear advance. But then from CASP5 through CASP12 for 15 years, there was almost no progress. Let's, let's take a look at that. These are slides from John Mould, which he showed 
um, at the CASP conference. And basically what you see here are uh, uh, polynomial regressions of the predictions, the individual predictions, which are not shown as dots here, but which you will see in a few of the other slides. And you see CASP1 was indeed uh, the lowest by far, uh, especially for the difficult targets. The difficulty here is estimated by the number of homologs that you can find. And the difficulty um, in this area was sufficient that the models were essentially random. They almost had no similarity to the actual structures. Now CASP2, you see there was progress, particularly among the difficult ones. And CASP3 marked a very clear progress when the power of homology became established. And here you see the power of Rosetta, again, a very strong advance in uh, GDTTS scores between uh, structures and models. But then here, all these lines are the next 16 years. And, you know, that was seriously depressing, uh, not only because there was no real progress, but because some years were worse than previous years. So we don't even see a linear increase in the order of the lines. Up through CASP 12, we had a standstill. Um, and that standstill is basically what Thomas Lengawa referred to as uh, the problem being solved long after it has stopped being relevant. And my seriously considering and even writing in some opinion pieces that I will not live to see the solution. But things moved on. And in CASP 13, we saw the first systematic use of artificial intelligence by some of the leading groups. And um, AlphaFold was entered here by DeepMind and it won the competition. It scored best of all the predictors, but not decisively better. And so if we look at it here, you can see some of these dots which show you that the uh, regressions are in fact a very cleansed version of a rather messy array of data. Um, what you see here is that CASP 13 is very substantially uh, upward from CASP 12, particularly for difficult targets. And we see further, I will talk about it presently, that the servers in CASP 14 are better than the best human predictors were in CASP 13. So we see another important advance in this graph. So let's come to CASP 14 and to AlphaFold 2 and what happened at, um, with the protein structure prediction problem. So here you can see the same graphs and you see that in, in CASP 14, AlphaFold 2 was far ahead of anyone else, right? You can see that the others also made clear progress relative to previous years, right? This is CASP 14 without AlphaFold, but nevertheless, the distance to AlphaFold has grown very large. And we will take a look at that. Right, so in this um, CASP experiment, we were the assessors for the so-called high accuracy targets, which in the graphs we saw before are typically the easier targets, while Nigrishin was the assessor for the topology part, which are typically the difficult targets. But as you will see in this CASP competition, everything became a target of high accuracy because AlphaFold filed extremely good models even for the hardest targets. So what this graph shows you is the best model for each of the targets that were filed in CASP 14 in blue, CASP 13 in green, 
and CASP-12 in yellow. And you can see that the advance from CASP-13 to CASP-14 is indeed extremely substantial. Further, you can see that alpha fold is not really very dependent on how easy the target is. Uh, alpha fold did comparably well with the hard targets as it did with the easy targets. And that is a very interesting finding because everybody else, um, not only in CASP-12 and CASP-13, but also in CASP-14, if you omit alpha fold predictions, sees a strong decay in scores from easy to hard. So this was um, something that alerted us to the fact that there is a very serious progress breakthrough going on here. And so let me tell you a few things about the scoring, not much, but I just want to uh, compare the scoring function we used, which was developed by Joana Pereira, um, to the scoring function that had been used in CASP-13. CASP-13 was already a further development over the scoring function in CASP-12 because it started incorporating dihedral and chi angles in order to measure accuracy. But Joanna added one further term, and this term measures whether the model is actually stereochemically better than the target, which is a crystal structure typically. And the mere fact that we thought it was necessary to introduce this term, in other words, that we might be faced with a situation where a model was actually better than the crystal structure, shows how far we realized the progress went. And so Joanna introduced this, and this was also a very pleasing development, I think, for anyone who thinks of the uh, development, the scientific development of young scientists. She did her PhD developing this metric. And so she was the perfect woman in the perfect place when we became the assessors and were able to use her expertise in this. Right, so this is one of the more complicated targets, one of the hard targets, and the alpha fold model. The target is shown, the target structure is shown in cyan, and the alpha fold model is in magenta. And even though this is a hard target and it's complicated and it is made of two domains, one domain here, one domain here, um, AlphaFold essentially made an almost perfect prediction. And in fact, it is so good that we could not judge, even after detailed analysis, whether differences between the target and the model uh, meant that the model was in error, or rather meant that the structure was in error, and that this was a minor confirmation uh, under natural conditions, which nevertheless was crystallized in this way for uh, packing reasons, for example, or for uh, reasons of the ionic environment. And so we had a meeting of assessors uh, in late August, and Nick Rishin, who was assessing the topologies, and whom you also, I'm sure, know because he is a member of our scientific advisory board, uh, essentially said that either this group is close to solving the folding problem or they cheated somehow. And that was initially a worry. I mean, the models were so good that we were worried there was something happening that we had not figured out. And um, partly that may be because in one of the early CASPs, um, Alexei Merzin showed a structure prediction by Google. Google was at the time a new search service and it permeated most of the people's computers without them realizing. And so if you made an elaborate Google search, you had a certain chance to find a structure of a target which 
the experimental group had already put on their website or had stored in another format. And so, yes, uh, with, with Alexei Merzin in mind, we thought maybe there is a way to cut corners. And so I proposed the following thing, to file a target of an unsolved data set which we had and had not been able to solve for the better part of a decade. If AlphaFold or anyone else could file models that were good enough for us to solve the data set by molecular replacement, then that would conclusively rule out any form of cheating that could be conceived. And so we did that and we filed a diffraction data set for this protein here. It's a fairly short, it's a minimal size, hyperthermostable transmembrane receptor. As we now know, it has a pass domain in the extracytoplasmic part, has two transmembrane regions. So it goes from inside to the outside, has its pass domain, comes back in, and then only has a HAMP domain, which is a transducer of signals across the membrane as the intracellular part. And I might be um, have the time to show you, or maybe not, why we're interested in this. But in any case, we got good diffraction data fairly early on. And then we were simply not able to solve the phasing problem. And so, so we took one of the alpha fold models and the structure fell right out. Marcus, as I recall, told me that it took him minutes to solve the data set with the structure from AlphaFold. And here you can see the superposition of the structure Marcus determined in gray and the model AlphaFold filed in red. And you see that the agreement is amazing given that this is a very elongated molecule so any change in angle in any of these elements would have led to very substantial RMS deviations. But in fact, the deviations were quite small. The superposition in all C alpha atoms for the model to the structure was less than 2.5 angstroms, which yeah, is amazingly good. All right, so let us look where others stood on this target. So we see here the GDTTS and the GDTHA, the high accuracy measure, which I had already mentioned. And here we also see in the last column, uh, Joanna's scoring function. And you see in the distance from the first ranking to the second ranking model, that GDTTS is much more lenient than GDTHA and um, Joanna's scoring function is the most stringent. It puts a particular value on the details of the structure being correct. Now we have seen here in the superposition, um, the alpha fold model with the crystal structure. Let's look at some of the other ones. All the ones I've highlighted in ochre are the same set of coordinates. And that was really stunning to me when I started to realize that I was seeing the same structure over and over. I at first failed to completely fail to understand what was going on. It seemed impossible that two groups would arrive at exactly the set, same set of coordinates. And then it dawned on me, um, everybody can file someone else's model. There's no requirement that the model needs to be your yours, all you have to do is to file what you consider the best model. And so what seems to have happened is this server here, Tfold Cat, which is um, a server from the company Tencent, a Chinese company, which probably many of you uh, know, um, made a model. And since their server is public, lots of others use the server to derive coordinates. And everyone who filed a model that is shown in Ochre thought that the model was so good that they filed it as their prediction. Now, a few people 
shown in lighter ochre, um, modified the structure slightly, and in all cases made it worse than the automated server prediction. The only thing that they managed to correct were uh, essentially sidechain rotamers, which is what Joanna's function um, put a premium on and therefore ranked them in the order you see here. So this is the model that Tfold cat produced. Now, even though in detail it, the model is not nearly as good as the alpha fold model, you can see that overall it's really impressive. I mean, in, in any of the previous CASPs, this would have been seen as a triumph. And um, yet it was, it was uh, dwarfed in its uh, accuracy by the alpha fold model. Here we also see, as I mentioned, that some of the human groups tried to change the computational model. Um, here, the uh, Kihara group. And um, the change is minor, just the angle of this helix was changed slightly, but this also made the model worse. So, you know, um, win some, lose some. And this is from David Baker. Uh, the Baker group overall uh, was probably the best next group after AlphaFold. And together with the Zhang servers was ahead of the pack. But you can see that there are substantial errors here which are even more pronounced than the ones in the Tfold cat model. All right, and Marcus has tried to solve the AF1503 structure with uh, the other models by molecular replacement, and it hasn't worked. The only ones that worked were the alpha fold models. So what happened in CAS14? Oh, first of all, we got to see some really impressive models. Were they as good as crystal structures? In some cases, they might have even been better. But in most cases, I think that further optimization will be possible. And so I think that AlphaFold 2 is the first step of a very exciting new direction rather than the last word in this. This ties in with the next question, is the protein folding problem now solved? And I would say most certainly not. And the reason for that is that the sequence of a protein specifies a lot more things than just the overall structure. For example, in biology, in nature, if you make a protein, the protein will recognize its ligands, will recognize its partners. Um, it might stay away from membranes, but adhere to nucleic acids. It, it will have a complex set of behaviors which are fully encoded in its sequence. And so there's a lot more things we expect will become predictable from the sequence um, by these approaches that have been so successful in predicting the overall static three-dimensional structure. In other words, AlphaFold 2 does not predict protein-protein interactions. It does not predict dynamics. It does not predict ligands. It does not predict unstructure. But all of these are things in directions in which these methods can now move. And I will, I will uh, elaborate uh, on this image, but for me, the situation is like Columbus setting over to the Americas. When he left, people honestly were skeptical that there was anything that would come of it. And he even had problems finding someone to finance his trip until the kings of Spain decided to do it. Um, once he came back, everything had changed. People suddenly knew that there was something really worthwhile on the other side, and that this could be reached with the existing ships. 
And so I think the situation now is that most people in structured prediction have understood that the data, the information for this breakthrough is already in our databases and that the deep learning methods we have by and large are sufficient to get us there if we apply them in uh, a fortunate way, let us say, right? And so I think that uh, other leading groups, which I've listed here, like David Baker and Yang Zhang and, and the Tencent group uh, are behind, but they're all on their ships heading over. And they're not necessarily trying to sail the Columbus route. They're trying to get to Brazil, to Canada, to the Northeast Passage, uh, to the Northwest Passage, excuse me, to round Cap Horn and to do all sorts of other things. And so my bias is that what we will see is not only groups that are scrambling to catch up with Alpha Fo2, but also groups that are heading over into directions that it's not clear Alpha Fo2 is heading in. And so I would suspect that there are a lot of graduate students currently who are not sleeping very much, but it's just a guess. Now, when and how will the alpha fold method become available? Um, your guess is as good as mine. Um, the uh, DeepMind team has said that they intend to make it available as a server and that they intend to publish a paper which describes their methodology. So I trust that a lot of the information will become available to the scientific community within a reasonably short amount of time. Uh, but right now I suspect that they're completely swamped with requests, with inquiries, and with writing their own papers on this breakthrough. So I would say don't hold your breath, but do expect that there will be a lot of progress in your ability to just use servers in order to get very high quality models. And so that brings me to the more uh, general speculation of what this means for us and um, where I think this is going. And of course, keep in mind that it is difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. So I may turn out to be really rather wrong about some of these things. But it seems clear to me that every area which found it worthwhile to invest so much effort into determining structures experimentally will suddenly experience a dramatic uh, boost in its work by receiving high quality structural information about their protein uh, pretty much up front, pretty much as one of the first steps in the project. That's, that's going to empower biologists tremendously. The other thing is, of course, and I think that's also uh, a fairly safe prediction, that there are a lot of good data sets in the experimental groups which languish unsolved because one problem or the other cannot be solved, typically the phasing problem. Now, we had such a situation and with the model, we solved it readily. And there were other people in the CASP experiment. Uh, I believe overall there were five or six groups who solved their data sets with alpha fold models. So to me, it seems clear that within the year, we'll see the solution of a lot of things that right now are just sitting there. Now, I also think that within a few years, um, computation will be the main source of structural information. And so many papers uh, which currently are looked at a bit obliquely for publishing models that may or may not be correct, uh, will get a strong boost in being able to publish biological theory and uh, biological um, models without actually going through the pain of having high resolution experimental data. 
and the experimental data will more and more be relegated to validating models or exploring particular aspects of the proteins which cannot directly be predicted reliably, such as possibly dynamics. Um, another point that will change pretty dramatically is our ability to design proteins. Currently, we can design proteins fairly well at sequence length of um, between 60 and 150 residues. But beyond that, it becomes exponentially harder to design anything reasonable. Uh, now, with much, much better ability to evaluate the folding potential of sequences, we should be able to move into the realm of the average protein, which is typically around 300, 350 residues long. And if we can start predicting what these proteins have in terms of uh, interaction potentials, uh, then a lot of biological networks, cellular networks, which are relevant both to biological inquiry and, and to medicine, to therapeutics, uh, will become explorable in silico. And that means that we can explore hypotheses on a very large scale in the computer before we ever go into an animal model. And that means also that we'll use considerably fewer animals. And I think that's also a thoroughly good thing that all of us are looking forward to. And so if all these things come to pass in a step that I would say is science fiction, but maybe not as far away as, as we think, we should be able to start designing not just proteins, but protein networks, de novo. In other words, build entire systems of proteins that do advanced functionality. And we wouldn't have to rely on simply rewiring genetic information from existing organisms to do this. We could actually design the components ourselves. And with this, I would say this is the best point at which to stop and to ask you whether you have questions or points you would like to discuss, contributions to these ideas.